Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to be back on Educational Psychology Reach Out. Um, my name's Patrick. I'm uh, an EP, an educational psychologist that works for Tower Hamlets EP service. The last time I was on, we talked a little bit about um, nurturing resilience and sustaining resilience. And one of the kind of foundations of resilience is sleep. So I thought we could explore sleep a bit more today. There's a lot we can talk about, but we've only got a short space of time. So I'm hoping it will be kind of an introduction to certain themes and people might then want to go away and, and do some more reading around the topic. Um, so hopefully it will be somewhat insightful for you all. So in today's session, I'm hoping to explore the benefits and the importance of a healthy sleep pattern explore some of the factors which impact sleep. Think about the physiological kind of underpinning of sleep. So what makes us sleepy? Think about bedtime routines and managing sleep patterns, particularly the sleep patterns of children. If there are any questions at any point that people have, use the Q&A function and I'll be able to kind of look at those at the end of the session. Um, so, at the start, I asked whether people could think about the benefits of a healthy sleep pattern. And if we think about what sleep can do for us, there are a number of factors. It can help, for example, with our thinking processes, it can help with our reaction time when we're, when we're awake, um, it maintains our level of uh, alert, alertness, it can have a positive impact on our immune system, prevent heart disease for example, prevent the risk of diabetes developing, it reduces the likelihood of irritability which in turn helps our relationships with others, and so whilst it's great to kind of take a positive viewpoint, it's also important to really fully understand the kind of negative impact that sleep deprivation can have. So effects of sleep deprivation, obviously are the opposite of what I've just said in terms of the positive factors. So you have increased in irritability if you don't get enough sleep, there's cognitive impairment, memory lapses or losses, and that's because during deep sleep as well, our memories are stored within our long-term memory, um, impaired moral judgment, symptoms similar to ADHD, um, which is really important and I think a key reason why I wanted to talk about sleep today um, for families as well as other professionals that we need to really make sure we explore the sleep patterns of the children and young people that we're working with to ascertain whether or not that's an underlying reason for some of the behaviour we're seeing for example, in the home or in school. Impaired immune system, increase, increased rate of heart disease, increased reaction time, uh, increased kind of processing time. So it takes children and young people longer to process what's going on in the classroom, which might lead to them, for example, becoming somewhat disillusioned by learning because they're not able to contribute their thoughts as quickly as other children. For example, when they put their hands up to answer a question, and there's um, growth suppression, so muscles and tissue won't grow as it should. So thinking about what might impact sleep, we've got nightmares, night terrors, sleep disorders, safeguarding concerns, family relationships, school friendships, chaotic home life, lack of routine, the media, social media, news stories, particularly relevant for the current climate that we're in. Parental mental health, especially for those of children, because actually normally children rely on parents to support a good bedtime routine, and especially young children support children in, in going to sleep in the first place. Child anxiety, school pressures, work pressures if you're an adult, peer group pressure, stress at home, separation of parents, bereavement, and then also environmental issues can have a, a big impact on our sleep routine and sleep patterns. Overcrowding, 
lack of a play space, their bedroom environment and technology. So how we're interacting with technology um, during the day, but also especially in the run up to sleep. And then there are also medical issues, um, illnesses, obesity, sleep apnea, and additional um, biological or, or medical needs that can impact on sleep. Diet, exercise, alcohol and drugs all have an impact. Some of those positives such as diet and exercise, whereas alcohol and drugs are um, factors which can negatively impact sleep. Puberty is also important, and we'll come on to that in terms of teenagers later on. Moving jobs, moving class, moving school, and social issues such as poverty and stress at home, stress in the workplace, or stress in school. So there's a multitude of factors which impact our ability to have a healthy sleep kind of bedtime routine and a healthy sleep pattern. So what makes us sleepy? There are two processes, two systems, if you like, which are working um, in tandem with one another, which help us to sleep. Um, one of those systems is the sleep-wake homeostasis, or sleep drive, and the other being our circadian rhythm. So if you look at the top bar, process S, this is our sleep drive, and you notice that the sleep drive increases throughout the day, and it starts off in that morning. So our sleep drive starts the moment we wake up. So the moment we wake up is when our sleep drive is, is generated and continues to generate and build up and build up until, as you can see, we go to bed where it will decrease. And then our circadian system is also operating throughout the day. So the two kind of work in tandem with one another to help us to feel sleepy, to then go off to sleep um, when it's time at night time. So as I said, the homeostatic sleep factor is generated by our time awake, creating a sleep pressure at bedtime. With each hour of wakefulness in the day, the hormone adenosine rises, which creates our sleep drive. And here we can see the impact that caffeine has. Caffeine blocks the adenosine receptors. So in some way, caffeine just delays the onset of feeling tired because the adenosine is still, is still in our system, it's still rising, but kind of the brain isn't recognizing it because the caffeine is blocking those receptors. So once the caffeine wears off, we're then kind of faced with this kind of overwhelming need to sleep, especially if it's later in the day. And the circadian rhythm um, is again our main sleep-wake regulator and it works in conjunction with our sleep drive. Um, the main clock, if you like, is located in the hypothalamus. Light and temperature have the biggest influence on our body clock and morning light is one of the most powerful influences on our sleep-wake pattern. Um, and that's really important to think about when we are, when we're wanting to make sure we get up at a similar amount, a similar time kind of on a daily basis, because actually by doing that, by being consistent, our sleep wake pattern, our sleep drive, circadian rhythm is functioning as it should. So if you think, for example, that we, or you might have a bedroom where you've got black, that kind of really, appropriate curtains in the sense that it blocks out all lights and people think that's great, that's fantastic. Um, and maybe in summer it is, for example, when the sun would normally come up at four, but if it's 10 a.m. and your room's pitch black, your body isn't gonna start to kind of wake up as it should. And the circadian rhythm and your sleep drive isn't gonna be functioning as it should. So kind of having curtains slightly open in the morning to let some natural light come in is really good for our body just to start to adjust and for those processes to start working. And an important hormone for sleep is melatonin and it's produced kind of when the sun goes down so when it starts to get dark outside um, you feel less alert and more sleepy with melatonin in your system especially the higher levels of melatonin there are. And as I said earlier, in terms of sunlight in the morning, melatonin levels will start to drop when natural light or light itself um, 
comes into kind of contact with us. Um, it can help regulate our circadian rhythm and the timing of when sleep occurs. And it's also impacted by temperature as well as by light. So, you know, being too cold, for example, could have a negative effect on melatonin production. Being too hot can have a negative impact as well. That melatonin is really important because it helps us to get into that deep stage of sleep, which I'm going to come on to now. So in terms of our sleep, we go through various cycles throughout the night. So if you look at the, the line at the bottom, we've got hours of sleep. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is hours zero, one, two, for example, at the start of the night when you first go to sleep. And on the left-hand column, we've got the different sleep stages. So when we're awake, it's at the top. Stage one, which is the lightest sleep. Then stage two, stage three, and stage four. Stage four, stages three and four are our deepest levels of sleep. And this is where, for example, muscle tissue, is growing um, kind of our organs are kind of regenerating if you like um, and also kind of our cognitive thought processes are are working so our thoughts are being stored as they should if you look at the chart we can see that the deepest stages of sleep generally occur early on in the night so kind of at the start of our sleep phase and that's really important because our levels of melatonin are highest as we go to bed so as it becomes dark our melatonin fires up in our body and it's at its highest level in the run-up to going to bed and that's important because that melatonin helps us get into that deep state of sleep so if we for example don't acknowledge that actually you know at for adults 10 p.m is the optimum time to be going to bed because that's when our melatonin levels are at its highest. We run, the, we run the risk of missing out on those deepest stages of sleep, um, which is really important to know. Um, and if we notice here, for example, the top REM, rapid eye movement, that's when we generally have our dreams. So as I said, sleep stages, we fall asleep and we're in light sleep in stage one. Stage two is when our heart rate slows, our body temperature drops. And then stage three and four is when we have deep sleep, our muscles and tissues repair itself. Thought processes, our thoughts are stored, which helps them with our cognitive um, processes during the day. And this is just a chart which shows average sleep needs for children um, and young people. So if we see here, for a four-year-old, their average night time sleep is an hour, 11 and a half hours. Five years, it's 11 hours. Six years, 10 hours, 45 minutes. So you can see that there's not really any much drastic change between, between ages. Um, and when they're 16, it's nine hours sleep. And then as we go into adults, I think really we try um, and advise that we have about eight hours sleep a night. It would be great if we could have nine, but most adults won't get that especially during the week um, and so this is I think a really helpful guide in supporting families parents understand just how much sleep their child should be trying to get and therefore help them understand you know when bedtime routine should begin because you think to yourselves what time does my child need to be up in the morning for school for example and then you can work backwards and we'll talk a bit more about that later on so there are challenges um, in terms of having a, a healthy sleep routine, having a health, healthy sleep pattern. Some of those challenges relate to anxiety around sleep. So there could be unresolved long-term sleep issues. Separation and anxiety can come into play. Family breakdown, bereavement. Some of the factors we talked about at the very start of this webinar. Um, safeguarding friendship issues, school pressures, new school, new job, work pressures, nightmares, fears, fears of dark, the darkness, fears of monsters can all come into play. And this can lead to bedtime battles, difficulties in falling asleep, having a delayed or a late sleep phase, inappropriate sleep associations and night waking. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit more about inappropriate sleep associations, just to explain what that is. So it's one of the most common sleep problems in children. Uh, a child will learn to fall asleep with certain conditions that's present at bedtime when they first go to sleep. So those conditions might be that a light is left on, for example, be it in the hallway, um, or their parents is next to them when they're falling asleep, or they have a certain toy, for example, next to them when they fall asleep. And then when they are asleep, what might happen is parents or carers switch off that lantern light in the hall, remove that teddy from the bed, or they themselves are no longer with their child um, as they move out of the room and either go downstairs or go to bed themselves. So when the child, if we think back to the um, stage of sleep, we kind of are in and out of deep sleep. And there might be episodes where we go into light sleep and then children may stare a little bit. And rather than easily going back to sleep, what we might find is because they have not got the same associations that they had when they went to sleep, they then kind of stir and become more alert. So what's really helpful is that we try and keep the environment the same throughout the night. So if the landing light is on for a child when they go to sleep, the landing light should be kept on all night. And as well as that is we want to try and create more independence for how the child falls asleep in the first place. So there is a method that I'll talk about later on in this where parents can really reduce the amount of mediation they need to give to their child for their child to fall asleep and also return to sleep if they wake up in the night. So managing anxiety, we can manage anxiety around sleep through a thorough assessment of what might be the cause and this is really I think important for um, professionals, be it psychologists for example out there to, to question the sleep patterns of children or young people that they're working with um, and if there are unhealthy sleep routines unhealthy sleep patterns we can start to ask certain questions which might unpick what they are um, and it may be that we then for those that are more complex signpost them to other relevant professionals um, kind of the expertise if you like in um, sleep difficulties and talk about worries in the daytime not at bedtime so you might have talk time for children where you discuss any concerns they have, any worries about sleep, any worries about the, the day in general, worries about school. Seek professional help if challenges and difficulties persist. Um, children that may be, for example, scared of the dark, you can play hide and seek in the dark with torches during daytime, you know, to kind of make it fun. And then avoid scary books or scary TV, particularly in the run up to bedtime. Winding down and have a good bedtime routine is really important. Set limits so everyone knows the rules and what, have, what is allowed at bedtime and what's not allowed, and also in the run up to bedtime. Um, think about relaxation techniques. A little bedtime massage can also be really nice for young children. Um, and the late sleep phase program may be appropriate. And again, I will talk about that at the end, as well as the gradual retreat program. Um, and then also allowing the child to have a security object or nightlight. So the nightlight is important because it has normally a low intensity of light being emitted, which is important so that it doesn't impact the production of melatonin and won't cause a child to become highly alert if they stir during the night. So bedtime routine is the anchor of pre-sleep. Um, it introduces cues for sleeping it helps us regulate the body clock and it's never too late to introduce a bedtime routine. And um, what I would say though is, is if a bedtime routine hasn't necessarily been that secure in the past, it will take time for that to be embedded and it will take time for a child to respond to that. You can't expect them to suddenly on day one of introducing a bedtime routine to stick to it. So we need an element of kind of perseverance to ensure that they know what the expectations are and then they can become accustomed to it. The bedtime routine should last no longer than 45 minutes, and that's important. It doesn't drag on and on and on. It's just important to start to help regulate the body and prepare the child or young person for sleep. Um, so how can we promote a positive bedtime routine? Establish, establishing a regular bedtime, and that includes at weekends. 
um, it's really important. Avoid stimulating activities before sleep. Screens should be off. There should be clear boundaries, dim the lights. And also be thinking, for example, if we dim the light in one room, but then we're going to another, we don't want a big bright light in the hallway. Um, and it can be challenging to have that consistency around our homes, but it's important for it to be effective. Um, a short five minute warm bath can be really helpful. Um, reading stories, positive stories are nice, but limit that. And ultimately we want to be in a position where we can leave the bedroom while the child is still awake because the child then is getting themselves off to sleep, which means if they were to stir during the night, they can get themselves back to sleep. Obviously for some families, they won't be at that stage yet, but there's a way that we can get to that, which I'll discuss in a bit. Um, and also tryptophan snacks um, are really helpful. So foods that can be really beneficial to help with the production of melatonin and to help prepare us to sleep. Obviously think about the quantity that we're eating. We don't want to have too much where our energy levels rise to then keep us stimulated and awake. So some banana, some almonds um, are good, or some cherries have a, are a, have a natural source of melatonin. Whole grain foods such as crackers, peanut butter, um, whole grain cereal with some milk. Turkey um, is a good food to have um, for sleep. Um, if you're gonna have it in a sandwich, have it with kind of whole wheat bread. And then certain herbal decaf teas are also helpful. Um, although there are some teas that can have, that can have, some teas that can have a stimulating effect, such as ginseng. So we want to try and avoid those. Um, and I think this is important that you know, whilst we don't want to have a heavy meal before bedtime, having a having a light snack can be helpful, especially if we struggle with going to sleep. So. Media and lights uh, has a really big impact on our sleep. Modern LED screens emit short, wave, short wavelength blue light, which suppresses the natural production of melatonin and therefore will delay the onset of sleep. Children are particularly more susceptible um, because their eyes are built up in such a way that they allow more light in. So it's important for everyone to avoid all screens an hour before bedtime, um, especially in the 45 minutes running up to sleep. So screen should be off, phone should be off, for example, um, no TV, you know, so sometimes they might have a family that, you know, says, oh, I, I let my child have the DVD run in, in the background to help them sleep. And I think, well, while sometimes a little bit of low level noise might be helpful, them actually watching something on screen is not. So for those children that have got, say, ingrained sleep associations, such as listening to something as they sleep, rather than kind of stop that completely, you can reduce it over time and I think certain things are more helpful than others so if it's about listening to a calming CD that's better than for example watching something on the screen and exercises is known to help promote healthy sleep patterns so regular exercise 30 minutes three or four times a week is, is really powerful but also we don't want to be exercising right up to the moment when we sleep we know that exercise helps to release endorphins, is stimulating. So if we have too many endorphins released so close to going to sleep, it's gonna impact and delay that sleep onset. Something to really bear in mind is, is teenagers. Um, so we are kind of faced with a common occurrence that teenagers will go to bed quite late, are hard to um, wake up in the morning for school, and there are biological reasons for this, which I think is important to bear in mind, that there is a natural shift in their body clock, which means that actually they aren't tired enough to go to sleep until later in the night, and therefore naturally need to sleep in longer to make sure they have the adequate amount of sleep. And that's not them being you know, um, challenging or difficult, that's what their body is telling them. And it's interesting that there have been a couple of schools in the UK that have done an experiment to see whether or not delaying the start of the school day has a positive impact on academic achievement, on behaviour, emotional regulation, and it has. So whilst we don't see all schools adopting that delayed start time, if you like, it's important to understand that many of our teenagers won't be getting the amount of sleep that they need, and we need to keep that in mind. Um, and, and it's therefore really important that whilst their natural body clock is somewhat different, and that body clock then readjusts itself going into adulthood, but while they're teenagers, 
we need to do everything we can to support them in having a healthy sleep routine um, and especially a healthy um, routine in the run up to going to bed. Because if you like, kind of the odds are against them at the moment because of this biological um, shift in their body clock. Social reasons as well demand on their time. Teenagers have more kind of pressures in terms of exam preparation, schoolwork, trying to socialise with their friends. They're allowed to have more independence in going out with their friends, for example. Sleep is seen as a low priority, and there are also other biological factors, um, such as sleep disorders, which come into play. So have a sleep friendly environment, encourage bedtime routines, even for our teenagers. If we do that as adults, that will then feed into what, our, what if we have, for example, teenage children do. Um, dim the lights, cut out late night phone calls, try to avoid arguments. Um, and again, agree a time, for example, when they're allowed their phone in the evenings and up to what point. Um, and maybe early on in the evening, even when they are allowed it, there are certain phones, for example, where you can adjust the lighting on your phone. And if we said, you know, let's start that at six o'clock, even if they're allowed their phone up until, say, nine o'clock, by adjusting the, the, the light on that phone, it's a starting point. Um, encourage teens to have a regular sleep and wake time, sleeping and waking times, which is really important. The idea, for example, that we can, you know, um, have low levels of sleep during the week, but then try and catch up on the weekend is, you know, it sounds great, but actually it doesn't work. So if we are severely sleep deprived, week in, week out, we can't catch up with our sleep. So in a way, like the damage has already been done to the body. So that's why it's important to have regular kind of waking times and regular times when we go to sleep. It feeds back into our sleep drive and the circadian rhythm. That's all needed to maintain a healthy routine and a healthy pattern. So if they do want to have a bit of a lazy start to the weekend, that's okay. It's good to just have some chill time in bed, but actually sleeping, you know, two, more than two or three hours extra is then going to have a negative impact on that cycle. Educate them on diet, educate them on what it means to have a healthy sleep routine and why it's important. And it's also important for professionals out there to support parents because parents aren't always up to date and, and in the importance of sleep. Um, and also can be really find it difficult to try and negotiate with their children. So sometimes we just need to support parents um, in helping them with their children and helping them with their teenage children particularly. Um, F.Lux is a free downloadable program um, and it adjusts our screen automatically over time according to what the light is like outside. So if children, teenagers are, for example, doing work in the evening, schoolwork, Whatever time of year it is, the program registers what the daylight hours are like. So slowly we'll start to adjust the light intensity of the screen, which means if children are working close to bedtime, it won't have that negative impact of, of blaring out bright LED lights. Um, so two methods I want to talk about before we finish, I know that we are running very close to 8.30, is the gradual retreat method, which really is helpful for supporting children in becoming more independent in falling asleep and therefore requiring less adult mediation, less adult input if they are to wake during the night. So the aim of the technique is for the adult to move on to the next degree of physical separation until they are outside of the room. Um, and we use this at bedtime and for all night wakening. So depending on where children are now in terms of how they get to sleep, Will have an impact on where parents start off. So if you're starting off, for example, where you're in bed with them under the blanket, that's the first stage that you start on. If you're already, for example, um, on stage, for example, um, five, where you're kind of halfway out the door when the child is asleep, going off to sleep, then that's the stage that you start at as well. And you can see that every fourth, well, on this slide it tells you that every fourth night you move to the next degree of separation. So on the first night, you start off with, for example, stage one, and then four nights later, you move on to stage two, and so on and so on. If a child were to, you wait until the child is completely asleep before then you move off, be it downstairs or into your own room. If they wait during the night, you revert back to the stage that you were at when they went to sleep. 
So if, for example, you're on stage six when they're going off to sleep at the start of the night and they wake up during the night, you return to stage six. Um, when we're trying to get this routine and this pattern embedded, we might find that children take that bit longer to go to sleep in the first place. But I think it's important for parents to persevere because the, the long-term benefits that this has on for the child and for you as a family is great because it means that actually you could get to the point where all the child might need is you calling out the night saying it's okay we're here for them then to resettle so rather than you as a parent having to get up out of bed to go into the next bedroom where you're not really sleeping to then return to your own bedroom it's complex and challenging so perseverance is key here and if the child takes longer to go to sleep in the first place don't worry just persevere um, and you can use this with a reward system as well so try and resist please to return to the previous position and stay firm and if you're doing it gradually step by step the child shouldn't notice much of change the last um, technique i want to talk about is delayed sleep phase so some of our children for example have got into a habit of going to sleep late at night um, and then it's hard to suddenly adjust that what's important first of all is to note on average what should my child be having in terms of sleep how many hours of sleep should they have um, and if for example you know your child should have 10 hours of sleep a night on average you then think what time do, what time do they need to wake up in the morning what time do i need them to be up to get them dressed or for them to get themselves dressed for breakfast etc and then go to school and you work back so if you need them to be awake for example um, at say 6 a.m and they need 10 hours of sleep then they should be asleep at eight o'clock, 8 p.m. You therefore need to start bedtime routine 45 minutes before that at quarter past seven, okay? Now, if at the moment they aren't going to bed until 11 p.m. and therefore bedtime routine isn't starting until 10, 15 p.m., you can see that we've got a few hours of discrepancy. Now, rather than on day one or day two suddenly adjust to the right time, we need to do it in increments. So, you adjust by 15 minutes, okay? So over time, there's a shift in sleep time and bedtime routine time. You need to wake up the child at the same time every morning, so there's that consistency. So here we can see the goal, for example, in this child's case is in step 11, where they'll be asleep by 8.30. But at the moment, they're going to sleep at 11 p.m., where you can see at step one. So every, every day or every other day, we slowly move step by step. So we're adjusting it by 15 minutes, which means that a child can manage those changes without it then having negative repercussions. Um, I wanna mention Mill Pond Sleep, Children's Sleep Clinic. Um, you know, a lot of the information that I have shared with you today has originated from training that I received from Mill Pond a few years ago. Um, and they're a really um, helpful service for, for parents, for families where, who are struggling with, with their children's sleep patterns. Um, and they will also have further links on their site to other resources um, and other agencies. I'm just gonna quickly check questions. So, someone's asked, uh, someone said, I've noticed that when, um, someone kind of eats earlier in the evening and the sleep is deeper and more refreshing and I wonder if there's any research from this um, and I think it's that's when I mentioned about certain snacks being helpful for sleep that's why it's important to think about the the quantity that we're eating you know if we're eating for example a full meal before bedtime then our body is working the digestive system is working um, and for example that then can't shut down um, and we know that, for example, for us to go into a deep stage of sleep, our body temperature needs to decrease. Um, and that's not going to happen if our, for example, digestive system's working. So I think if we're having meal times, actually having them earlier on in the evening is probably a positive factor. But that's not to say that we can't have a light snack that contains tryptophan to help us sleep. Um, and then someone's mentioned there about the suggestion of snacks and you know, considering the high sugar content, um, it's curious about bananas and milk. And I suppose that's why, again, it's about moderation. So rather than having a whole banana, you might have a small bit of banana. Um, 
and rather than having like a large quantity of milk, you have a small quantity of milk. Um, but the product that, that what is in the milk, for example, and what is in the bananas in terms of um, the nutrients and how it helps to develop, say, the production of melatonin, that's kind of, it outweighs the, the negative impact that sugar content can have, especially if we're having it in moderation. And then someone's asked about um, how to support parents, for example, with their children's sleep patterns, because parents themselves can have struggles with their own sleep patterns. Um, and I think that's important. I think, you know, whilst this has been very much fat geared towards supporting children today's session, sleep routine is important for all adults. You know, I have to think about myself and actually I sleep my best when actually I have that downtime, downtime before going to bed where I don't have my phone or my iPad on. Um, and I think trying to find out about a child's bedtime routine and then link it into parents is really helpful. So parents might come and say, oh, I've got to be in bed with them or they're in our bed. And they actually kind of turn it around and say, oh, that must be quite challenging and quite difficult. You know, what's your ideal goal? And working through that with them can then help them be in a secure place to support their children. Someone's asked about um, when to give their child a snack before bedtime. And I think it's important to think about, first of all, if they are sleeping okay at the moment, then there's no need to give them a snack. If they're struggling with um, with a healthy sleep pattern, if they're, they're struggling with going to sleep, then it might be about experimenting. So for example, rather than having some of those foods that we mentioned that may have a naturally high sugar content, start with something else. So maybe a little bit of turkey, for example, or maybe something whole grain. Um, and maybe, for example, you try that again 45 minutes before bedtime. So in, in the run up to sleep, the 45 minutes before, we don't want to eat anything, but maybe an hour before might be helpful and have a small, small quantity um, and then kind of evaluate whether or not you think that this is having a positive or negative impact. But again, if someone struggles already with attention and focus, you want to make sure that you choose the foods which have the lowest levels of sugar content. Um, so, as, and someone there has asked a specific question again. Um, what might be helpful is, again, as I said, thinking about snack time an hour before bed. And if, for example, there are things going on, for example, if they are taking medications, what I would do is I'd probably suggest talk with a professional that's prescribed for medication as well, because some, for example, children on medication in terms of focus, some children are on medication in terms of melatonin production, because some children um, have less melatonin being produced than other children. Um, and what I would do is I wouldn't suddenly shift a change in routines overnight. So it might be that what's best is you keep a sleep diary over the course of a week to find out at the moment what time they're going to bed, what time they fall asleep and what time they wake up. And then you can also note on that what food they're having and at what time, and then also at what time they're having the medication. And by if you then make small adjustments and note that time, you can then measure over the course of a couple of weeks or a month if it's having any negative impact. And maybe sharing that information with, say, your GP or a paediatrician um, would be really helpful. So my suggestion is to try and keep a sleep diary over a course of a week, noting the time such as food snacks, um, before bedtime that is and any medication and then sharing that with your GP is probably the best way to go rather than me give um, advice which might not be helpful for your individual case. So thank you very much for joining us today. I'm sorry that it's gone on but there's been a lot to talk about. Um, for those families that I said that may have more challenges um, with supporting a healthy sleep routine then please check out Mill Pond Sleep Clinic and Sarah and Nicole have put that link up as well. So thank you very much. Um, I hope it's been really helpful and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.